You're listening to Cotton Tales Podcast, part of the Silicon Valley Black Project, which produced the documentary film A Place at the Table about the Black pioneers of Silicon Valley. A Place at the Table can be viewed for rent on Vimeo.com on demand backslash a place at the table stem. Through Cotton Tales podcast, the Silicon Valley Black Project will continue to recognize the contributions made by African Americans. We will be featuring African American professionals, technologists in the fields of engineering, administration, and entrepreneurial pursuits from the past and present. Cotton Tales podcast is honored to present Raina Parks. She is a mechanical engineering manager at Lockheed. Raina holds several degrees in engineering as well as a master's in music. Raina, tell us more about yourself. So I actually have um, uh, four degrees. My initial degree was in mechanical engineering, a bachelor's. Um, at the University of Oklahoma. And then I decided that I needed to go back to school after working for about four years. Uh, I wasn't ready to go into management at that time, but I knew long-term I'd like to. Um, but uh, I cast about for what does the universe say I should do? I thought about being an astronaut. That was always a childhood dream. And I remember looking that up at the time going, wow, I, you know, I've got the qualifications here, but I don't really want to do that anymore. Um, and I'd been singing for a bit in the area where I was working, and um, someone had you know, taught, encouraged me to go into music. So I then got a master's in performing arts at the, um, at the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. And so that was a uh, first master's, and then um, I did, uh, after graduating, I went back to work. Um, because uh, music it feeds the soul, but not necessarily the belly. <laughs> I figured I would be working as an engineer to augment um, that passion of mine and um, went back to get a master's in systems engineering and an MBA, um, which I just finished in, I think it was 2017. I noticed there was a gap. Uh, were you working on your mechanical engineering degree as well as your music degree, or were, or were you working just working at a company and then went back and got your engineering degree? I, I was working at a company when I, I, I got the engineering degree, then I came and worked for Hewlett Packard, California, and worked there for, actually it ended up being almost six years, but about four years into working there was when I went to get the start the master's in music. I had actually uh, talked to my initial boss who hired me and said, I want to do this. Can you guys help me out? I don't, I don't necessarily see myself leaving the engineering world, but I do want to pursue this degree. And um, I, I was hoping we could do something part-time. And that boss said, no, I don't think so. But he did give my name to another manager in another department. And she said, I think we can accommodate so for um, about the first year and maybe three or four months of my two-year degree, I was working part-time at Hewlett Packard, and I moved from a manufacturing engineer to a materials engineer. Um, they changed to Agilent Technology. Uh, I was able to work um, part-time from home and one day in the office because as a materials engineer, my job was to interface with uh, suppliers and subcontractors mm -hmm. about parts, you know, various commodities. Mine were things like fans and heaters, thermal products, um, and maybe also shielding. We had some of that. So I was able to do both for a short time. And then um, Agilent, HP Agilent, um, moved some of its production to Malaysia, mm -hmm. which I'd been supporting. And uh, they had, uh, I survived two rounds of layoffs, and the third round of layoffs caught me. So I finished out school, and I took about an eight-month break, I think, from the time I finished my next, uh, my next position. So did you go to Malaysia? I did, actually. It was great. I had, I, I'd have daily meetings with them for a while as well, because at 5 p.m. for us, it was 8 a.m. for them. But um, when we were near the end of transitioning this product and transitioning the manufacturing of certain components because a certain percentage of those components had to be manufactured in Malaysia to receive the tax break. Mm -hmm. I was able to go over and meet with uh, my peers there who would be the manufacturing engineers for the product 
to meet with supplier for the extrusion that we were sourcing there. And uh, it was it was quite eye opening. I got to say to go to another country. I really loved you know that two weeks there of just being in that country and and even going to Singapore for a bit and seeing uh, suppliers there. It was really a neat neat uh, adventure. I thought. So you were pretty young then. How were you perceived by your older co-workers? In Malaysia or in... Uh, Both. In, uh, the in the U.S. and in Malaysia. I just started working, you know, right out of college for Hewlett Packard. So I was, I was, you know, definitely in my early to mid-20s when all this was going on. I had a lot of folks who took me under their wing and helped me to learn more. Um, you, you know, I think uh, folks... For the young so you know, when someone new and a junior comes in, they, they try to help them along, but they don't want to impose too much. Cause I, I definitely had that sense of, I can do it. I can, you know, prove myself. And it was only after you work through that that you realize, I need help. So I had folks who were definitely willing to mentor me and help me understand the process and, and understand people and make the connections and the network that I needed to do well in that, in that field. You know, uh, in my film, there's a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Wilbur Jackson, and he talks about that very thing. He doesn't get to tell you the whole story, but uh, he was moved around uh, the globe by IBM, and this mm -hmm. one guy mm -hmm. would always show up, and uh, he finally he asked him, are you following me? And the guy said, no, I'm mentoring you, and I'm the one that's recommending that you be sent to these places. <laughs> You have a network, and we, you know, we're watching you, and we're making sure your career goes in a certain path. And it's called networking. It takes a little while to figure all that stuff out. That's you know that you actually have a mentor. How about the Malaysian workers? What was your life like working well, with um, them? Age wasn't an issue so much as being a female there. My peers in Malaysia were engineers, were male. Um, there were women who worked there, but they tended to work on the production line itself. They weren't necessarily engineers. So um, I remember getting so frustrated. We were at a manufacturer's facility um, for this extrusion, and I was trying to stress the importance of a critical dimension, and I was asking them about their process, how they were going to maintain that dimension, uh, because it, with any extrusion, it, as it cools, that, that changes. So you've got to get the formula just right. I found my peer, um, who was about my age, um, there in Singapore, restating what I would say or ask to the supplier. And I'm thinking, why are you saying that I just said? I just said that, or I just asked that. Or, so I think there was an aspect of the culture that I wasn't getting. I may have been ruffling the feathers of the subcontractor, so I realized this guy's probably trying to make sure that this subcontractor doesn't think that I'm questioning their abilities to get information. When you go into another country, there's a whole different set of rules, particularly around uh, gender. We struggle with it here, and we find out not only are you not listened to, but you're not supposed to be listened to. They have to repeat it for you, or nobody I hears it. I traveled there with a white male colleague who was uh, on the electrical side. I was on the mechanical side. He could ask a question. There was no restating. There was no, <laughs> you know, they listened to what he said, and it was not a problem. But whenever I spoke up to push an issue or to question an issue, it had to be restated by the male colleague. Did the uh, experience in Malaysia affect how you were treated or how you were looked at in terms of your skill set once you got back to the States, did, they, did the American side feel that there was something uh, lacking or did they realize that you were the skilled um, one? In the you know, I, I don't recall any negative blowback from it. I actually think it helped because it was a little before talking to my boss about going back to, for my master's and him helping me uh, get in touch with the manager who was willing to take me on in a part-time capacity in another group. It showed my ability to work across cultures to make sure that my questions were answered, but no one was uncomfortable in the team. Because in the end, that was the goal. And even though I might have felt like as a woman, guys should listen to me, my goal was, are these guys good enough to do what I need them to do? If I could get that answered, how I got that answered, you know, my ego might have been a little smushed, but the answer was still provided. So that was what was important, and I was able to get that answered.
And there was no, you know, it wasn't as if I was in danger. It wasn't as if anyone was overtly mean or rude to me, you know. Mm -hmm. This was a, a micro inequality, and, and that's part of life. That's part of being black in America. Take it in stride, huh? <laughs> Just exactly. one more level. Exactly. Tell me now how, how your musical background helped you as a technologist. Definitely. Um, with music, I learned uh, history and art. So I think it expands my ability to think as an engineer. I also think outside of the box more now than I did before the music degree. I spent a lot of time in math, which is, it has answers, you know, solutions. <laughs> I got to define them. Um, however, in the gray space, of quantum mechanics or, you know, the, the next evolution, I think, of where technology is going. Um, math is no longer one plus one is two. You've got non-Euclidean geometry. You've got these areas that I think we have to not only approach and overcome, but really excel in. Um, quantum computers realize the next technological leap. And music helped me think about things or helps me think about things in a way that I wouldn't have normally. Uh, with music, it, it, I, the, the singing of a, of a note is not on or off. It's not yes or no. There's so many variations on it. There's, there's, um, there's pitch, there's air pressure, there's um, vocal cord um, engagement. There's all these aspects of your physiology and your health <laughs> that produce a sound. And and when I for me as, as an engineer, I've always thought organically about things. I, I actually thought about becoming a doctor after my bachelor's degree because a human body is a system, hmm. a mechanical system, electrical system. Um, so thinking of a my mechanical my engineering problem as a system changes the way I approach it. And it may not be the problem I'm staring at that's the issue, which is why it led me to systems engineering, which is more, a more holistic look at a problem. You know, all of the parameters affecting it, not just the problem itself, not just the fact that something's rattling in my box when I buy it. Yeah. I, I was a music major myself, and I didn't, oh, wow. I never equated that in a mathematical way. I always thought of it as just the way you play the particular measure in front of I you. Think yeah. it's about, uh, yeah. Someone talked about math, music is being the joy of counting. That's a good one. That's a good one. It is a joy. Now, being a music major, I have a, a real connection with you when it comes to music. And I was going to ask you, uh, what is your favorite, uh, who's your favorite composer? First of all, uh, who do you have me. one? <laughs> As a child, it was Beethoven. I <laughs> love that dark, pounding music you could feel when you were playing the piano. That was just, ah. Uh, as a singer, um, you know, the, the music that my voice is most suited for, um, and I just love the richness of the tone and the chords and the sweeping movements. And, um, you know, there, there's some French composers. Um, I'm singing a foray requiem right now, which is really gorgeous, and there's something ethereal about that music. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I have, I have lots of little favorites. It, it just depends more on my mood, I think, and, yeah. <laughs> and where I'm, where, what I'm thinking about. I'm actually now getting into... Indian music and the scales and those um, and those forms of music. It's not, you know, an octave scale. They're ragas, they're called, and they and and, and there may not be the same notes up and down the scale. Um, to think of that as being an ordered music, because I listen to it with a Western ear and I go, well, there's something about order in there, but it feels very chaotic. But there is very much an order to. Um, traditional Indian music that Westerners don't get. It piques my curiosity to go, you know, I've got this very set pentatonic uh, scale here, octave scale, uh, scales that are, to me, just kind of very block form now that I've, I've spent a lot of time studying it to it. I'm curious to see what others have and other cultures have done with music and how they shape it and how it shapes us. No, I understand what you're saying. Uh, in fact, when you say Indian music is not like uh, traditional Western music, I think gospel music is 
probably so different. When we were at the rehearsal last night, and we were doing the Eveline, Don't Nobody Bring Me No Bad News, which is, is a very gospel setting of music. Yes. And so one of the things that they decided to do was just repeat the last, you know, couple phrases 16 times. We have to sing that measure 16 times. So they're counting. But as the lady up there who's directing us is counting, the group just starts to have church. <laughs> and and people don't when they see that they're going what are they doing? Yeah, in the page. I never learned gospel. I grew up singing it. I never learned to read it. Um, and which is why I have a hard time sight reading music by ear. Okay. I play the piano by looking at the notes because I taught myself to read music to play the piano because I hear the Beethoven or these pieces that I wanted to play, so I had to learn that. But singing was natural. Singing was just breathed and sang, and there it was. I, you know, I, I can relate to that as well because I played violin and viola and piano, and so you think that I, I, I can read music, but like you say, I didn't read it to sing. I read it to play an instrument. And uh, mm-hmm. usually, though, uh, if I could get it a good solid A, I could kind of feel my way, you know, <laughs> and figure out the song. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was not, it's not that easy to sing, um, you know, and read music at the just not. Oh, no. no. I agree. Yeah. Just, to me, they don't feel, in, it's not an intuitive feel. Um, and maybe it's just, like I said, it could be my upbringing. I did not approach music. But, you know, no one approaches singing looking at, you don't look at notes. If you're playing as a child, you're playing the piano. I look at my kids who like to play around with the piano. They certainly don't approach it looking at music. It's just harder, I think, with something like piano if you don't know the mechanics of how chords work. Yeah, yeah. It helps. But singing is so flexible, it's so intuitive and yeah. visceral. It's very visceral. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, how about your children? You just mentioned them. Do they have tendencies towards music or more of the uh, engineering type? <laughs> well, so I'm working on a project in the garage right now. Um, putting, I'm, I'm organizing it. It's a mess. So I'm putting in my pool system, and my youngest son comes out to me and says, Are you engineering in the garage? Yes, I'm engineering in the garage. I want to be an engineer, too. But the thing about him is he is my artist. <laughs> Not the youngest. He's just... He's just got this, he'll be doing something and singing and not realize that he's singing. It's just part of his his being almost. My oldest, who's two years older than him, they're six and four. The oldest is my engineer. He's very black and white about his thoughts, very logical. He's very organized. He presents a problem and he tries to solve it logically. And I say, he's either going to be a lawyer or an engineer because that's his approach. Mm-hmm. And he will probably play an instrument because he's that focused if he wants to learn something he's got to do it but my husband and i were talking about it my husband's a musician as well the oldest will probably come to the youngest and say look look joshie i've written this great piece don't you think it's awesome and it's terrific and i just love this piece and joshie's just going to take it and turn it over and say why don't you play it like i mean that's i see both of you know both of myself and both of them definitely see one of them emerging more as an artist he's very much into his feeling and his you know uh, like he draws on anything I, I, he will draw he drew on the bed sheet he's just he just has to do his art i, I hope that whatever he chooses that it is fulfilling and productive well, you know, I, I'm, in fact, I can really identify with him. And you, like you say, when you sing, you're just singing organically. I can just see myself. I played viola um, uh, in this orchestra. A conductor had stopped the orchestra, and, there was, and he was instructing one section. And the girl behind me tapped me. And she said, how do you play like that? When you're in an orchestra, the music comes from the floor up. You know, mm-hmm. you're not, it doesn't come at you. You're in the I music. I way about singing. I, I sing by feeling. I don't, you can't hear yourself. You're, you're the instrument, right? What you hear is not what the audience is hearing. I hear myself when I'm singing or I think I'm hearing it. I think I sound one way. And then I hear a recording. Uh, I wonder what you felt like when the first time you helped, heard yourself sing. What did you I feel like? I felt like, like um, it was, it felt lighter. 
felt higher. I hear it myself. I think I have a, a richer voice than I do. Um, and it's not that it isn't a gorgeous voice, I think, for some people. Um, <laughs> but I'm hearing the Eugene Price, you know. And it's not that I'm I, I'm not her, but I'm more of a Leona Mitchell. You know, it, it's, a, it's a different sound. It's a sweeter sound. It, and I didn't think I sounded so sweet. But thank God you do. <laughs> Just think of that. What is your octave? What is your range? Um, probably, well, I know my highest is an E, e flat, somewhere in there, mm-hmm. uh, above um, high C. And what? lowest, I've gotten down pretty low to maybe like a G, A, G, somewhere in there. So it's about... Yeah, uh, mm-hmm. almost mm-hmm. four mm-hmm. octaves so there. I just finished up show, Big River... Um, I was on stage for that one um, okay. as a, the gospel soloist, but I was Alice in the show singing the solo. You can change it. Um, but it kind of brought me back into music with the kids so young. I mean, once I started having children, and I was also working on my master's while having the children, um, I did not get a chance to sing very much. So now that they're a little older, I can leave them at the sitters for longer. You know, they can talk. They can tell me if something's going on. I feel more comfortable letting them go and stay with her longer and um, doing stuff like this more. How do you get your gig? Do you uh, are you chosen, or do people know about it's you? Word of and... mouth lately, like mm-hmm. even the Big River was someone who worked with me at Lockheed and heard me sing there at, some, uh, at a I forgot what it was, but um, and then he was in the show and they needed someone to sing this role, and he said I I know someone who I think can, and he's on the board, so he suggested me. I auditioned for the group, got him, and got the role, and then so for the Wiz, they were again looking for singers. They in African American singing, high sopranos, I don't think there's many fine alto mezzo voices. So they were looking for sopranos, and I thought, well, and it, it was a pit singer role, so I thought, I could do that. You know, I'm sitting here with the orchestra just singing, I love it. So um, that was word of mouth. And then the foray was also word of mouth. Someone else was at the, the, the Big River show and, and asked me to. Um, Sing with his group that's doing that piece. So I used to sing professionally more so. I sing paying gigs. Um, and since and easing back into it as I have, that's not been as important to me. Wow. So, and But you're yeah. still working full time at Lockheed, is that right? So all this singing is either evening or weekends? I think um, as I was pursuing things more professionally, um, I did sing, say, for instance, Porgy and Bess on the chorus at the Opera House uh, in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I I, uh, I thought at one point maybe I'll try chorus because they, they're not paid too badly. Um, and I didn't get in, which was probably a good thing because I don't know that that was the path for me. I remember saying so much uh, quite a while ago in my career that I did not want to have to sing for my supper. Uh, because that, for me, I felt like it might compromise joy and reason for it. Um, that being said, I certainly admire and respect those who do and think it's amazing when you get that opportunity. That, that's a very hard industry to, first of all, to, to get into. And once you're mm-hmm. there, it, to maintain a, a living wage is a pretty, pretty hard. You have to be super, super good or have some fantastic connections. You say your husband is a musician as well. Do you pl- do you sing with him, or has he sang with you? We've been singing together. Actually, oh, I met oh. him years before that at someone else's production, but um, we didn't really hit it off then, which was fine. I, you know, singing real small, but I remember meeting him well before he remembers meeting me. We started to date right after a performance we'd had where we were the leads in the show. It was a opera about Fannie Lou Hamer. And he, I was singing Fannie Lou, and he was singing my husband, Pat. So um, we decided not to date during the show because we didn't want to show romance, you know. <laughs> it happens while you're there, and then it fizzles out. So um, I told him, well, you know, after the show, we can go. The, the day after it, the, the show ends, or it might have been the day the show ended, but it was very, cl- very close to that. My husband said, so you want to go out now? I said, well, sure. Or my not then soon because and then uh, he, I said, well, when do you want to go? He said, tomorrow. And how long have you been married now? Um, we're seven years. We'll be eight years this year. Well, he made a good decision. Heck. 
<laughs> he kind of knew yes. what what he wanted then. Yes, we both, I think, were at a point where we knew what we wanted. We both wanted children. You know, we both wanted, we, we both liked, I think, the aspect that we had music um, that it, uh, that we, we were united by. And also, he's fairly technical. He didn't get a technical degree. Uh, his father was a civil engineer, and he works as a audiovisual tech uh, at his job. And so he's very good at s- sound systems, setting up and installing sound systems. So, again, somewhat technical, but then it marries to that, you know, musical aspect of his um, his world, too. How fortunate you both are to to be able to combine art as well as you know your technical side. That that is an that's unusual, I think, uh, because you get to satisfy both sides of your brain every day. Yeah. So what mm-hmm. do you th- what do you think about these private um, space guys going into space? What do you think about that? Competition is good, and I think it drives down costs. Um, I. You know, we're supposed to be a capitalist society, and I don't think we are, <laughs> no matter what people think. Um, and uh, some aspects of capitalism do help the marketplace. So uh, a private company speeding along what even the government says is possible, what um, companies that have done it the same old way because there's so many government requirements in place have thought it's possible. It's important to move us, uh, to move the needle on where we're going. They're, they're causing every industry to rethink how we approach uh, space travel. And um, and I, I think we've got to do that. We've got to shake things up, but we're going to keep doing it the same way. I encourage it. I'm, I'm very excited about what what those advancements will do for places like, uh, uh, you know, Lockheed, where I work. About, do you think it would help Lockheed, or do you... Do you think it would be... Uh... No, I think it will be... Um, you know, I'm not sure. I say that only because I think if we can be adaptable enough, it will certainly help us. Mm-hmm. If nothing else, it certainly helps people's um, interest and verve and vigor and to about space. And that's important. You know, space has become kind of a, ah, uh, whatever. You know, oh, people went to the moon or didn't. You know, we don't do it anymore. You know? um, I think once it becomes... Um, embedded in our lives, in our in our society, in our economy, um, and space uh, itself pr- shows uh, us what's possible. Um, it will certainly help Lockheed and other companies. So, I you know I look forward to that. I look forward to becoming uh, uh, more of a central aspect of of what we think about our society and what we want to do. You know, th- there's another thing that I think about when it comes to space travel, private versus government. They should be willing to exchange ideas and information across the lines. If you're private or government owned, I'm hoping that they're sharing information so that we can move forward faster because if you know, if we don't, uh, I think someone's going to come yeah, up I think short. I read something about yeah. that, that. That's definitely happening more among companies more of a shared basis for a commonality uh, just like they had to do with the space station you know they were putting that together different countries were building different capsules you know mm-hmm. it had to be a common set of standards between them so that they would latch on to each other you know? Yeah, I think ultimately we have to realize that we're all on this blue ball out in the middle of nowhere. We, whatever efforts that are made are human efforts. Yeah, we have to I, do them I together. Hope, I really hope. You know, I read a lot of sci-fi, of course, as an engineer. And, and you hear a lot about science fiction and also psychology and the thought that it takes catastrophe and major events um, to pull humanity together. I really hope we can get to the next point in evolution without that catastrophic event. It's not just the people, it's the animals, it's the planet. We're all connected, and we're all connected to the universe. You know, I think, I really hope we are able to get there without um, there being something so catastrophic to shake us out of our old ideas and thoughts and the the things that we impose in each other, like races and imposition. We did our DNA, too, and my dad found out you know, by the, by the DNA, he's half white. My mom would, how's that possible? <laughs> Let me tell you how that's possible. <laughs> 
race is it's not in, non-existent. I think the moment I heard the first heart transplant was in South Africa, and it was a black man's heart that was put into a white man's body. And when that happened, I said, "Okay, you have to just erase all the lines now because one, it's called a species, all right, and that's mm-hmm. what we are. We are a species, just mm-hmm. like uh, you know, alligators are a species of animal. We're a species of animal as well. And if you can take one man's heart and put him in another, and, and he functions." then, sweetie, there's not not a whole lot of difference between that one man from another, especially if he doesn't reject the heart. So yeah. there he goes. Yeah. Yeah. All, yeah. all that argument is over. <laughs> yeah. Agreed. Tell me this. If you could turn back time and uh, live your life over again, what you would know, you do differently? I, I, I can't think of anything I would do differently. Um, I, and I say that in all sincerity. I, I've made some really wonderful decisions in my um, I've made some ones that, you know, probably weren't the best decisions in life. Um, but I'm very happy with what I've learned in the course of my journey. And I had to make the choices I made to be where I am and to be who I am. And so I, I don't look back on that and think, what could I have done differently? You know, I, I look back and I say, what did I learn from that? And um, how can I use that going forward? I was given so much, and I, I really, I realized how blessed and fortunate I, I was in my, you know, in my life, and how I did have lots of folks who were, who were looking out for me and who had my back, and, um, you know, that to me that was great, you know. Well, I, I can make one other suggestion that might happen uh, when you look back. You probably say. How did I accomplish all of that? Because <laughs> you were one busy lady. I'm telling you, working on master's degrees, having children, and my goodness, girl, you, you've done a lot. Yeah, my mother, um, who's also one of my um, my mentors and one of my, my folks that I, I live with. So my mother uh, is a, a nurse, um, and she, she has a, a, you know, her nursing degree and associates, and then um, she worked on her bachelor's degree while she was pregnant with me. She worked on her master's degree while she was pregnant with my brother. And then she worked on her PhD after that and then had a third child and, uh, you know, became VP of her nursing at her hospital. And, um, you know, so I, I, I never thought that I couldn't do a lot of things. Her mother was a seamstress uh, who also raised her family and who also did canning and sewing and, I mean, you know, sewing for the family and raised a garden and, you know, this idea that I as a woman had to limit myself to one thing or staying at home or, you know, anything like that, just, it, that was foreign to me. Yeah. Um, Good for you. Congratulations on everything you've done. You're just an incredible person. I'm, I am honored to interview you. I really hope that some young woman hears this and goes, hey, that's me. I can do that, you know. It's, um, yeah. it's a lot. It's a lot, but it, but like you say, it had to be done. And you had a good time, a wonderful time doing it. And look what you've accomplished. I've enjoyed every moment of it. Oh, no, no, let me not lie. I haven't enjoyed every moment of it, but every moment of it's been worth it. That's me. You know, it's, it's what I focus on. It's what, it, what is the game? And the game has definitely been positive. And, and I've learned so much through everything. So I really do hope that folks who are struggling through things or trying to make decisions understand that that's just part of the process. There's nothing wrong with it. Just keep going. All right. Well, on that note, I am going to end our conversation. Thank you so much, Raina, for uh, agreeing to be on my podcast. And I'm so proud that I'm going to present you to the world. I hope it, you, it gets out there and someone hears this and go, and changes their life. Well, now, when can we see The Wiz? Can we go and see the play? Yeah. And- April May time frame. I don't know the performance dates, but it is in Sunnyvale, California. I'll hear. I want to hear that voice. That's what I want to hear. Uh, so it's and, and what theater is that? There's a Sunnyvale kind of theater uh, community center over on Remington Drive. Oh yeah. Uh-huh. There's a theater in that in that community center. Okay. And it's called it's the Sunnyvale uh, Sunnyvale Community Players. Um, the name of the organization. Well, send me the information and I'll put it on my webpage 
and people can get that information and come and see or hear you. Thanks again. I really appreciate having the, the opportunity to talk. Take care, Raina. And thank you for listening.